Yat A, my relatives. Thank you for tuning into this video. I want to invite you to join me for the next hour or so to have a very important discussion about our national holiday of Thanksgiving. My name is Mark Charles, and I am the son of an American woman of Dutch heritage and a Navajo man. And like most Americans, I grew up celebrating Thanksgiving and never really gave it a second thought. As I began to study more about the history of our country, especially as it pertains to indigenous peoples and Native Americans, I began to get more and more uncomfortable with Thanksgiving as a holiday. And it was just a few years ago, 2017, 2018, that I came to the conclusion that I could no longer celebrate this holiday. So I want to take the next hour or so to share with you why I came to that conclusion. Now, I need to warn you, I'm going to be talking about some history that most likely you've never heard of before. And I'm going to be saying some things that will make you feel very, very uncomfortable. A lot of the content for this lecture comes from my book, Unsettling Truth, that I uh, co-authored with my good friend, Sung Chan Ra. Um, not all of the content is covered in the book, but a lot of it comes from there. But I'm really kind of framing this history around our national holiday of Thanksgiving. And so I don't know if you'll be able to watch this video all in one sitting. Some of you may need to turn it off and cool down for a little bit. Others of you may want to, um, you know, can work all the way through it. But whether it takes you just an hour to watch this or whether it takes you a week or even a month to get through this video, I want to encourage you to finish it. There's a history of our country that we need to learn how to talk about. We don't know how to talk about what we're built on and what we've done as a nation. And because of that, we continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. So if we want to heal, if we want to move forward in a better way, we have to learn how to address our history, how to acknowledge what we've done, how to create a common memory so that we can move forward and build a healthier community. So I invite you, I'm so glad you're here. I invite you to work through this whole video and uh, and thank you for joining me for this very, very important dialogue. So to start this process, we have to go back and I often go back to this point for many of my lectures, which is we have to start with the doctrine of discovery. Right? The Doctrine of Discovery, which is this series of papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. Right, This is the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever land you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. This is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the people. They didn't see them as human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was literally lost at sea, land in this new world, which was already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. The first sentence of the first chapter of my book on selling truth says you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can conquer those lands. You can steal those lands. You can colonize those lands. You can't discover them unless your bias informs you that the people living there are not fully human. So this makes the doctrine of discovery a white male supremacist and Christian nationalist doctrine that is the direct fruit of a church that has prostituted itself out to the empire. So that's where we start, right? This is what allowed Columbus to land in this new world and say he discovered the Americas. It was this doctrine, this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery. Now, to really understand the whole notion of uh, the whole notion of um, Thanksgiving, we have to understand Old Testament Israel's notion of promised lands. See, the people of Israel had a land covenant 
with the God of Abraham. The land covenant basically said if they obeyed God, God would bless them. If they disobeyed God, God would curse them. If they obeyed God, they would prosper on their lands. If they disobeyed God, they would be exiled from their lands. This covenant was reiterated in Deuteronomy chapter 30 when the people of Israel were standing on the banks of the Jordan River ready to cross over and take possession of their promised lands. And God, through Joshua, was reiterating the threats and promises of the land covenant. And it said that if you keep his commands and his ordinances and his laws and the articles of our covenant with him, that we may live and be multiplied and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land, whether we go over to possess it. But if our hearts shall turn it away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land, whether we pass over this river to possess it. So this was the land covenant. This is how their understanding of promised lands worked. Now, in 1621, we have unofficially the first Thanksgiving. This is often celebrated as this kind of kumbaya moment between Indians and pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. And it is seen as the beginning of the first of the celebration of Thanksgiving here in the United States. Now, the challenge is, is we don't talk about why this first Thanksgiving was held at Plymouth. What was behind, what was the circumstances behind this celebration taking place at Plymouth? Well, You see, in um, the Northeast, at that point, there was what was called, what was referred to as the Great Dying. The Great Dying, and this is taken from this website, the Mayflower 400, 400 Years of Wampanoag History. Um, It was between 1616 and 1619, and there was this disease that appeared, and it literally was destroying Native communities by the by villages it was literally it was going in and wiping out entire villages of native peoples very quickly like they were they would find these these villages that had been inhabited and thriving a year prior and they would find them later and they were just strewn with dead bodies and the people were suffering greatly and they were dying in large amounts um entire villages were lost only a fraction of the wampanoag nation survived in the winter of 1616 to 1617, an expedition dispatched by Sir Fernando Jorge's found a region devastated by war and disease. The remaining people were so sore and afflicted with the plague that for, the, um, for that the country was in a manner left void of inhabitants. Two years later, they found another plantation that was now completely empty with few inhabitants and those who survived were greatly suffering. So this great dying was taking place in the Northeast, in between 1616 and 1619. Now, in 1620, King James, and this is the same James that authorized the translation of the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, he um, issued the Charter of New England. And in this charter, I'm just going to read it for you. James, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and to all whom these presents shall come, greetings, whereas upon the humble petition of of divers of our well-disposed subjects that intended to make several plantations in the parts of America between the degrees of 34 and 45. Within these late years, there hath by God's visitation reigned a wonderful plague, together with many horrible slaughters and murders committed amongst the savages and brutish people, there heretofore inhabiting in a manner to the utter destruction, devastation, and depopulation of that whole territory, so that there is not left for many leagues together in a manner any that do claim or challenge any kind of interest therein, nor any other superior lord or sovereign to make claim hereunto. 
whereby we in our judgment are persuaded and satisfied that the appointed time is come in which Almighty God in his great goodness and bounty towards us and our people hath thought fit and determined that those large and goodly territories deserved as it were by their natural inhabitants should be possessed and enjoyed by such of our subjects and peoples as heretofore have and hereafter shall by his mercy and favor and by his powerful arm be directed and conducted thither. So the great dying takes place, wipes out entire villages, entire populations of native peoples. And in 1620, King George and his armies come across these devastated villages, and instead of having mercy and compassion and trying to help these people back, they celebrated it. They gave thanks to God for it. And they issued the New England Charter and said, well, because these people are dead, there's no one here to claim these lands. This is God giving us these lands. So the reason... One of the reasons the first Thanksgiving took place at Plymouth Rock was because this is an area that had been devastated by the great dying. A dying that King James and his subjects were praising God for because they saw it as a sign that he was leading them into the conquering of these new lands. So again, this this is this is a celebration. This first Thanksgiving and the words of King James just a year earlier was a thanksgiving to God for the genocide of native peoples, for the the, the dying off of entire native villages and populations. Now in 1630, there was a boat of colonists that came into what's now called the Boston Harbor, and they were um, there to plant the Boston colony. And on this boat was a Protestant pastor named John Winthrop, and he preached a sermon titled A Model of Christian Charity. In this sermon, he refers to the colonists that he's with as a city upon a hill. This is barring from the language of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells his disciples to be a lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, shining their good deeds into this dark world. He goes on to exhort them in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. They should rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. They should keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. This is just your basic Christian exhortation. Now, towards the end of his sermon, John Winthrop does what many pastors do, which is he uses threats and promises from the Old Testament to help his people, compel his congregants to heed his exhortations. And John Winthrop decides to quote from Deuteronomy chapter 30. That says, if we obey God, he will bless us. But if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we shall surely perish out of the good land, whether we pass over this. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river. But in his sermon, John Winthrop changes that word to vast sea. Now, why does he do that? Well, because they didn't cross a river, right? They crossed an ocean. So what John Winthrop is saying is that they are standing on the shores of their promised lands ready to go in and take possession of them. That's what he's implying here. This is why he changes river to vast sea. Now, if you keep reading in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua, you will see that God's pretty clear about his people, how his people are to take possession of their promised lands. It says, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them as the Lord your God has commanded you. So John Winthrop is saying that based on the exhortations of Jesus to be a city on a hill, based on the legacy of Old Testament Israel, they're standing on the shores of their promised land ready to go and take possession of them. And that literally means genocide. 
It means you have the right. Promised lands for one people literally means God-ordained genocide for the other group of people. Now, we'll just go a little bit further. In 1763, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains, and he says to the colonies that were there that they no longer had the right of discovery of the empty lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonies. They wanted access to those lands. So a few years later, they write a letter of protest. In their letter, just like King James did in the in the uh, in the the um, land charter, the New England land charter, he refers to um, well <laughs> in this proclamation, King George says that the people, the the colonies, do not have the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset those colonies because they wanted access to those lands. So a few years later, they write a letter of protest. In their letter, they accuse the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. And they go on to state that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages. Right? They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. Literally 30 lines below the statement I'm going to create equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages, just like King James did in the Charter of New England. So this makes the Declaration of Independence a systemically white supremacist document. Now, this notion of savages continues, and as our nation begins expanding westward, right, we go past the Appalachian Mountains, we go past the Mississippi River. End of the 1800s, we have what's called the Second Great Awakening. There's this growth in churches, a renewal of denominations, right? There's this religious fervor as the nation is headed further and further west. Early 1800s, the term manifest destiny is coined. The belief that this nation has the God-given right to rule these lands from sea to shining sea. Now, in, in the middle of this, it was actually in 1823, right as they were just coming into this notion of a manifest destiny, the understanding of promised lands. There's a Supreme Court case. Johnson versus Macintosh. This is two white men of European descent litigating over a single piece of land. Right? One of them got the land from a native tribe. The other one claimed to have gotten the same piece of land from the government. They want to know who owned it. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The court has to decide what is the legal precedent for land titles. Who had the right to sell the land, the, the, the government or the tribe? They rule that discovery is what gives title to the land by whose subject or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, and that title was consummated by possession. Now, because this would imply that native peoples, discovery would give rights and sovereignty to native peoples, they went on to clarify, and they said, but the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country weren't nations, they were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in, the, in possession of their own country was to leave the country a wilderness. Right? This is now this word savages is being embedded into Supreme Court case law. It later clarifies and basically says that natives are mere occupants of the land, like a fish would occupy water or a bird would occupy air. Europeans... They're fully human, so therefore they have the right of discovery to the land, and that's what gives them the fee title to the land. So they're the true landowners. This case, along with a few others, creates the legal precedent for land titles, and that precedent, as well as the doctrine of discovery, are referenced by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, 
and most recently in 2005. Now I have a whole TEDx talk going in depth into this case in 2005. I want to just talk about a few highlights of it. So in 2005, the Oneida Indian Nation was in the Supreme Court um, trying to reclaim sovereignty, traditional sovereignty over their lands. And the city of Cheryl, the lands that they had were claiming sovereignty over, wanted the, the, the tax revenue from those lands. And so they were suing the United Indian Nation in federal district court. The lower courts actually ruled in favor of the Oneida. And so the city of Cheryl appealed to the Court of Appeals. They upheld the lower court's decision. So they appealed to the Supreme Court. The court heard the case in 2004. In the first footnote of the case, the Supreme Court references where this is where they're setting precedent. They reference by name the doctrine of discovery. This is how things worked, basically saying. They accuse the Oneida, say, oh, given the long standing, distinctly non Indian character of the country and its inhabitants, the authority constantly exercised by New York State, and the Oneida's long delay in seeking judicial relief. We hold the tribe cannot unilaterally revive its ancient sovereignty. They then reference another case that said it's impossible to rescind the session and restore the Indians to their former rights because the lands have been open to settlement. Again, that was white settlement. And large portions of them are now in the possession of innumerable innocent, of course, white purchasers. Now, in building the case in 2005, the Supreme Court makes the argument that says, moreover, the properties here involved have greatly increased in value since the United sold them 200 years ago. It was not until lately that the United sought to regain ancient sovereignty over land converted from wilderness to become parts of a city like Cheryl. Right? They're basically making the exact same argument that the Supreme Court and John Marshall made in 1823. They're not using the word savages, but they're making the exact same argument. So they conclude, we reject the unification theory of the United Indian Nation and the United States, and we hold that the standards of federal Indian law and federal equity practice preclude the tribe from rekindling embers of sovereignty that long ago grew cold. Right? This is probably one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime, and it was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right? So again, we're just trying to help people understand how this notion of promised lands and this understanding of savages and this dehumanizing understanding of natives as savages and this notion of manifest destiny gets birthed so that as our nation is moving further and further west to complete its manifest destiny, A, it doesn't have a problem committing genocide, and B, it's not even considered genocide because these aren't people. These are savages, right? So when we look again at U.S. history in the 19th century, I made this chart. This was several years ago. This is U.S. history from 1775 to 2016. Every year in blue is a year I found that the United States was in a declared state of war, our armed military conflict against another nation or entity. Every year in red is every year I found us fighting native nations. You can see from 1811 to 1886, we had almost 75 straight years of warfare against native nations. Right, and this is the 19th century. This is the century we refer to as our century of expansion. Well, clearly this is an expansion. This is ethnic cleansing and genocide, right? This is a list of the wars I found we fought against Native nations primarily during the 19th century. It was during this century that we passed the Indian Removal Act. This is the act of Congress that gave the U.S. military in practice the right by force to remove nations, Native nations from their lands in the East to empty lands further in the West. This is the same period where we had what was called the Massacre at Wounded Knee, which was one of the deadliest massacres in our nation's history. Not the deadliest, but one of the most deadly in our nation's history. And we, we actually talk about this massacre a bit in our history books. We don't tell the whole story, of course, but we do talk about it. 
right? So in, in 1890, the, the, the um, Dakota were in negotiations with the U.S. Army about the surrender of some of the Dakota chiefs. They met at Wounded Knee. Both sides were heavily armed. Neither side trusted each other. The U.S. Army had several of these what are called Hotchkiss cannons. They shot several rounds a minute. They were accurate up to a few hundred yards. No one quite knows what happened, but someone fired a shot. They don't know if it was a native warrior or a U.S. soldier, but someone fired a shot and chaos just broke out. Now, the U.S. Army began firing these guns down. They were up on a, on a higher position. They began firing these guns down on the Dakota people. And at, at Wounded Knee, there's a ravine. And many of the Dakota people ran into the ravine to seek shelter from these guns. Now, one of the things we don't talk about with Wounded Knee is that the U.S. Congress awards 20 Congressional Medals of Honor to the U.S. soldiers who participated in the massacre at Wounded Knee. And three of those medals, the one for William Austin, the one for John Grisham, and the one for Albert McMillan, were given specifically for helping flush the Dakota people out of the ravine so they could be shot down by these guns, these Hotchkiss cannons from above. This is our country in 1840, the dark lands to the east, our established states, the Lighter lands to the west are territories or even uncharted lands. If you look up Medals of Honor, Congressional Medals of Honor, um, you can find them by war and by conflict. And if you look at Congressional Medals of Honor for the Indian War campaigns, you will find that between 1839 and 1898, the U.S. Congress awards 425 Congressional Medals of Honor to the U.S. soldiers who participated in the Indian War campaigns. End of that period, this is what the nation looked like. We've now completed our manifest destiny. During this period, the 19th century, the majority population balloons from 5.3 million to 76.2 million, and the native population collapses from 600,000 to 237,000. Now, if you're doing your math, that's a 61.47% rate of genocide. And if you're comparing your math, that's a higher rate of genocide than the Nazis had over the Jews in World War II. So we, there's no other way to say it. Between 1839 and 1898, the U.S. Congress awards 425 Medals of Honor for the genocide of American Indians and the ethnic cleansing of this continent. And they knew what they were doing. They were well aware of it. All right. In 1851, Peter Burnett, who was the first governor of California, giving his state of the state address, he said this. He said that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct. Must be expected, excuse me, must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power and the wisdom of man to avert. He's not saying famine is broken out and we can't feed the people, therefore they're dying. Nor is he saying um, disease has struck and we can't stop it spread, therefore they're dying. He is literally saying we cannot stop killing these people until we complete our manifest destiny and they're extinct. And this is perfectly in line with the thinking about promised lands. In Joshua 10, it says, So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Now, so what does this have to do with Thanksgiving, right? This is, this is the question. What does this have to do with Thanksgiving? Well, there are several feasts and there are several events that happen in the Old Testament that actually begin to set somewhat of a precedent for Thanksgiving. One of those precedents actually comes from Joshua chapter 8, right? Just a few chapters before this verse. See, 
the people of Israel, as they were going through Canaan, they were literally destroying entire cities and nations as they were going across and claiming their promised lands. And one of those nations, one of those cities was I, Ai. And in Joshua 8, this is what is recorded. So the people of Israel had gone in and they had tried, they had already lost a battle against, against I um, a few verses earlier, a few chapters earlier. And now they're going back to make sure they, they, they took the land. Um, and they decided that they were going to trick the people of the city. And so they um, put their army on both sides of the city. One that was behind the city were hidden and, and they, they snuck up there. And the other side was attacking from the front. And so as the, the front army came to attack the city, all of the soldiers, all the men in the city came out to fight the army that was coming directly towards them. When Once the men and the soldiers left the city to go and fight Joshua's army, the, the other half of the army came in from behind and they burned the city, burned it to a ground. Said when Israel had finished killing all the men of I in the fields and in the wilderness where they had chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to I and killed those who were in it, the women and children. 12,000 men and women fell that day, all the people of I. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he had destroyed all who lived there. Then Joshua built a mount, built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones, on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. Now, fellowship offerings in the book of Leviticus are defined in one sense as offerings of thanksgiving. And so I've actually seen, if you look on the web, you will see that there are churches referencing Joshua 8, verses 30 and 31, as a model of Israel offering thanksgiving and using that as precedent for our thanksgiving here in the United States. Now again, how... That's not a very close connection, just because there's a few churches out there doing this thing. Why that that doesn't quite put the nail in the coffin, right? That doesn't seal it. Well, to seal that, we have to understand the actions of one of our presidents. Now, the problem is, is the president whose actions we need to understand is the president we probably understand the least about. That's this man. You see, the challenge is, is that the victors write the history. And when victors write the history, they get to frame the narrative, right? They get to tell the story from their perspective. And this often results in not the accurate telling of history, but the creation of mythology, right? Just, again, for a moment, just pretend, pretend with me that Nazi Germany wins World War II. Let's just pretend it, okay? How would the Nazi historians have recorded the legacy of Hitler had Nazi Germany won World War II? Well, he'd be their greatest leader ever, right? How would the Nazi historians have recorded the Holocaust had they won World War II? We have Holocaust deniers today when they lost the war. Imagine if they won. What Holocaust? There was no Holocaust. That's what they would have done, right? No one would deny that. That's what they would have done. See, the problem is, is the United States of America has never lost a war that matters. We've never been invaded and disarmed. We've never given up large tracts of land. We've never had a regime change. We've never, we've never 
borne the, the scorn of the global community. We've never lost a war that matters. Technically, the Korean War is not over yet. We pulled out of Vietnam. We pulled out of Afghanistan. Our tails were tucked between our legs, but we didn't give up any land of our own land. Right? We've never lost a war that matters. And so throughout our entire history, we've written our own history. And because of that, we know nothing. We know squat about Abraham Lincoln. You see, Abraham Lincoln was a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist until the day he died. When he was introducing himself to the nation, this was in 1858 when he was running for Senate in the state of Illinois, it was known that he was against chattel slavery and wanted to end it. But not pe many people knew how he felt about the humanity of black lives. What do you think about equality? What do you think about what was going on, right? This is, this is 1858. The Dred Scott decision had just been decided in 1857. The debate of that midterm election was black lives, right? So introducing himself to the nation in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Lincoln was very clear. I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. I am not, nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. Now I'll say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together in terms of social and political equality. And in so much as they cannot so live while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, I'm in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Right? By his own admission, Abraham Lincoln was a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist. Remember, Dred Scott had just been decided. In this ruling, the Supreme Court stated that slaves were not citizens of the United States and therefore they could not expect any protection. Right? This was this was just like in the midterm elections in 2022 that we're dealing with now, right? Roe versus Wade was the debate. Do women have agency over their own bodies or not? That's the debate. The debate in 1858 was Dred Scott. Are slaves, are black people, if we're gonna be honest, protected by the Constitution? And this came up, right? Does the Declaration of Independence apply to the black race? This was a question in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And Lincoln said, I think the authors of that notable instrument intended to include all men, but they did not mean to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all men were equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. Now, he's not saying some men are taller and some men are shorter, some men are stronger and some men aren't quite as strong. He's not saying that. He is saying as he's already explained earlier one group of men are one group are superior and the other are inferior and it's the white race that's superior he was also asked about making citizens of black people and he said well judge douglas has said to you he has not been able to get an answer from me as to whether or not i am in favor i am in favor of negro citizenship so far as I know, the judge never asked me that question before. He shall have no occasion to ask it again, for I tell him very frankly, I am not in favor of Negro citizenship. It is my opinion that the different states have the power to make a Negro citizen under the Constitution if they choose. But if the state of Illinois had that power, I should be opposed to the exercise of it. So again, just, just to be clear, Abraham Lincoln was publicly agreeing with the Dred Scott decision. He was taking a side. Our foundations were not written to protect black people. He had no intention of making voters or jurors or Negroes. He had no intention of making them citizens. He had no intention of applying the Declaration of Independence to them. 
He was very, very, very clear. Right? So again, it's no surprise that the 13th Amendment, which is the, the, the legacy of his understanding of race, it makes perfect sense now why this amendment doesn't actually abolish slavery. It ends chattel slavery, but it does nothing about white supremacy. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist. This amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it and then constitutionally protects it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. The same criminal justice system that has the highest incarceration rate today of any country in the world and that incarcerates people of color at three to five times the rate it incarcerates white people. Again, Abraham Lincoln was a blatant, self-proclaimed, unapologetic white supremacist until the day he died. Now, in 1862, while he was president, Abraham Lincoln signed two bills. He signed the Homestead Act, which allocated 160 acres to anyone going west and homesteading for five years, and he signed the Pacific Railway Act which allocated the land and the resources to complete the Trent Country Railway. This was in the spring and summer of 1862. In the fall of 1862, we had the Dakota Wars. This was a very bloody war between the Dakota Nation and settlers in Minnesota. It lasted just over a month. At the end of the war, half of the Dakota warriors fled west or north into Canada. The other half surrendered. Those who surrendered were immediately put into military tribunals. They are now being tried by the very um, soldiers they were just fighting against. Um, in these trials, which was done in a foreign language, witnesses were shared. They lasted just a few minutes long, each of the trials. Hundreds of these Dakota warriors were found guilty and condemned to hanging. Now, that order was so genocidal that no one wanted to execute it. Went all the way up to Lincoln, and even he didn't want to do that. He was actually afraid that, well, so the Lincoln, the order came to Lincoln, and he couldn't bring himself to do it. But he didn't order retrials. Instead, what he did is he changed the criteria of what warranted a death sentence. That's what he did. Under his new criteria, only two of the Dakota warriors were sentenced to die. Well, now he was afraid that his white settlers in Minnesota, where they already were starting to do, they were going to uprise and cause more fighting and death and havoc. So again, a second time, he doesn't order retrials, even though these trials were clearly shams. He changes the criteria for a second time and lands on the magic number of 38. And so the day after Christmas, 1862, while the entire community came out, we had the largest mass execution in the history of our country with the hanging of the Dakota 38. On January 29 of 1863, we have the Bear River Massacre. I'm just going to read this for you. This is from the Smithsonian Magazine. In the frigid dawn of January 29, 1863, Segowich, a leader among the Shoshone of Bia Ogi, or Big River in what is now Idaho, stepped outside his lodge and saw a curious band of fog moving down the bluff towards him across a half-frozen river. The mist was no fog, though. It was steam rising from the sub-zero air from hundreds of U.S. Army foot soldiers, cavalry, and their horses. The army was coming for his people. Over the next four hours, the 200 soldiers under Colonel Patrick Connor's command killed 250 or more Shoshone, including at least 90 women, children, and infants. 
The Shoshone were shot, stabbed, and battered to death. Some were driven into the icy river to drown or freeze. Historians call the Bear River Massacre of 1863 the deadliest reported attack on Native Americans by the U.S. military, worse than Sand Creek, the Mariahs, and Wounded Knee. This was a turning point for the Shoshone and eventually led to their removal and bringing them to Oklahoma. In February of 1863, in response to the Dakota War of 1862, Abraham Lincoln um, ended all of the treaties nullified all the treaties with the Native nations in the state of Minnesota. In March of 1863, without treaty or negotiation, he ordered the removal of all Indian peoples, all Indian nations, out of Minnesota into the Dakota territories. This removal began in April. The people were rounded up. They were put on boats, put on barges, put on wagons, violently removed out of Minnesota, brought to a reservation that was not sustainable for them, it was a very unjust, violent removal. In the fall of 1863, under the command of Abraham Lincoln, General Carleton gave this order to commanders and soldiers in New Mexico and Arizona. Henceforth, every Navajo male is to be killed or taken prisoner on sight. Say to them, go to the Brosco Dondo, we will pursue you and destroy you. We will not make peace with you on any other terms. The war, this war shall be pursued until you cease to exist or you move, and there can be no other talk on the subject. The people went through the land. Kit Carson and other army commanders went through. They burned our villages. They killed our livestock. They rounded up our people. Raymond Friday Locke, in his book of the Navajo, wrote, By the middle of December, most of the weak in age had died. There is hardly a Navajo family that cannot remember tales of an aged grandfather, a pregnant mother, or a lame child that had to be left behind when the camp had to be quickly deserted. The patrols were not interested in taking captives. It was too much trouble to transport them back to the fort. Any Navajo they saw was shot on sight. Mothers were sometimes forced to suffocate their hungry crying babies to keep their families from being discovered and butchered by an army patrol. You look at this order. In January of 1864, you can see at the bottom of this piece that Abraham Lincoln approved the creation of Boscredondo. Now, Boscredondo was referred to as a reservation. Nearly 10,000 men, women, and children, Diné, men, women, and children, were marched down to Boscredondo. Hundreds of them died of starvation and exposure during this walk, and a quarter of them died while under guard in the squalor conditions that could, what only can be described as a death camp. In the book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, D. Brown writes, it was a wretched land, they said. The soldiers prodded them with bayonets and herded them into the adobe walled compounds where the soldier chiefs were always counting them and putting numbers down in little books to shelter themselves from rain. And some they had to dig holes in the sandy ground and cover and line them with mats of woven grass. They lived like prairie dogs in burrows. Crowded together as they were, disease had begun to take a toll on the weaker ones. It was a bad place. And although escape was dangerous and difficult under the watchful eyes of the soldiers, many were risking their lives to get away. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln signed the second half of the Pacific Railway Act, which increases the amount of land and resources provided to complete the Transcontinental Railway. In 1864, we have what's known as the Massacre at Sand Creek. So, 
the Cheyenne and Arapaho lived in eastern Colorado. And during the gold rush in the early 1850s, um, they had negotiated a reservation, and that reservation was basically run over as people ran into the Rocky Mountains to mine for gold. And so they, the U.S. Army renegotiated another treaty with the Cheyenne Arapaho, reducing their land holdings down to one sixteenth the size it was before. On November 29, 1864, the Cheyenne Arapaho were on their lands. They were waving a white flag of surrender to show they were there peacefully, and they were waving an American flag. And the U.S. Army, a Union Army, led by a Methodist pastor, came over the hill and ordered all of them slaughtered. Colonel John Shivington killed more than 200 Cheyenne Arapaho villagers, mostly elderly men, women, and children. He ordered his troops to take no prisoners and to pillage and to set the village ablaze, violently forcing the ambush and outnumbered Cheyenne Arapaho villagers to flee on foot. And later that evening, it was reported that the soldiers were parading the genitalia of the Cheyenne Arapaho down the streets of Denver in celebration. So we have these four events. Bear River Massacre, Dakota 38, the Navajo Long Walk, and the Sand Creek Massacre. In his annual message in 1864, Abraham Lincoln reported that 1.5 million acres were entered in under the Homestead Law and that the great enterprise of connecting the Atlantic with the Pacific States by railways and telegraph lines has been entered upon with a vigor that gives assurance of success. You see, to really put this in context, we have to look at what was taking place. This is a map of the early trans lines of the trans Transcontinental Rail Railway. The primary line, which is going through the cent uh, center of the country, had reached Omaha, Nebraska, had to go through Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and come out near San Francisco. There was a northern route that started in Duluth, Minnesota, went through Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, and came out near Seattle, Washington. And there was a southern route that went through the territories of New Mexico and the territory of Arizona and came out near Los Angeles, California. Right? So after the removal of the Dakota Winnebago from Minnesota, after the Sand Creek Massacre in eastern Colorado, after the Long Walk of the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache, and after the Bear River Massacre, of the Shoshone, you can see that Abraham Lincoln is literally ethnically cleansing the routes of the Transcontinental Railway, making him one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. Now, the reason this is important is because Abraham Lincoln is credited with making Thanksgiving, a national holiday, a unified national holiday. On October 3rd of 1863, Abraham Lincoln gave a Thanksgiving Day proclamation. And this is what he said. Needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the, the borders of our settlements, and the mines as well of iron and coal as of the precious metals have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. You see, as they were moving west, and with the passage of the, the, um, the uh, Pacific Railway Act in 1864, what they did is they gave the mineral rights to the railway companies to further financially incentivize them to complete the Transcontinental Railway. They were doing this so white settlement could move in. This was the whole purpose of this. And in his Thanksgiving Day proclamation, Abraham Lincoln is praising God for that. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlement. He is talking about white settlement moving west. He is talking about 
the mines that are being established because they gave the mineral rights to these railway companies. This is what's bringing prosperity to the nation. It has also pleased our Heavenly Father to favor as well as our citizens in their homes and our soldiers in their camps and our sailors on the rivers and seas with unusual health. He has largely augmented our free population by emancipation and by immigration. He has opened to us new sources of wealth and has crowned the labor of our working men in every department of industry with abundant rewards. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln said population has steadily increased and the country rejoining, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel, counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God. Abraham Lincoln is literally giving thanks, calling for a national day of thanksgiving in order to give thanks for the fruits of the genocide that he is actively committing. If you remember back to the passage in Joshua where the Israelites tricked the men of Ai and they sent two regiments out, right? One that came in front and one came behind. As they were attacking from the front, the men went out to meet them, leaving the women and the children in the city. Then the men from behind came in and burned the city. When the soldiers turned around to protect their city, they were met by soldiers, Israelites on both sides. After they had killed all the soldiers, they went back and they killed all of the men, all of the women and children left in the city. And then Abraham Lincoln and then Joshua gave thanksgiving to God. At the Sand Creek Massacre, over 200 people were killed, Native peoples were killed. Two-thirds of them were women and children. There are many accounts of the massacre at Sand Creek. Several accounts note that the men were out hunting, leaving the elders, the young people, and the women and children in the village. And that is who the Union Army, Abraham Lincoln's army, attacked. And Abraham Lincoln called for a national day of thanksgiving, giving thanks for the fruits of the genocide that he was actively committing. Now, if we look, and this is on the National Park Service's website, and they have kind of a timeline of Thanksgiving, you'll see that in 1922, the National Football League plays its first game on Thanksgiving Day. In 1934, the National Football League holds its first game on Thanksgiving Day. See, in the timeline of Thanksgiving in our nation. Even our government acknowledges that the National Football League plays a holds a, a special place in our nation's celebration of Thanksgiving. There are two teams that play traditionally every Thanksgiving. The Detroit Lions begin playing on Thanksgiving Day in 1934 and the Dallas Cowboys begin playing on Thanksgiving Day in 1966. On a whim, just a few years ago, I decided, I was curious, on Thanksgiving Day, who did the Cowboys play most frequently? What teams over those 50 plus years did they play with the most frequency on Thanksgiving? Many teams they played once or twice, Buffalo 
Buffalo Bills, the Chicago Bears, the Houston Oilers, the New Orleans Saints, a few teams they played three or four times, such as the Minnesota Vikings, the Seattle Seahawks, or the St. Louis Cardinals. They played the Miami Dolphins five times, but there was one team they played nine times. Nine times. Guess what team that was? Yeah. Washington Redskins, right? They played the Washington Redskins nine times. This is, again, part of our Thanksgiving Day tradition. Now, maybe you're thinking, wow, nine times. Well, they're a rivalry, right? This must have been good games. I mean, the NFL, they figured out their sport to a science, right? They know exactly what to do. They have their market down pat. They know how to market themselves. They know what makes money. They know what brings in advertisers. They know what brings in viewers. They understand their game so incredibly well. Right, So when the Dallas Cowboys play the Washington Redskins on Thanksgiving Day nine times, I mean, it must be great games, right? These must be really captivating games that are holding the attention of this nation. Well, actually, the Cowboys won eight of those games. And they won them by more than a touchdown. They're not even close games. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, yes, but there's a few decades, right? I mean, when you look at the, at the schedules of both of these teams, right, the, 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 the Cowboys have been in the Super Bowl eight times. The Redskins have been in the Super Bowl um, five times. The Cowboys have won five Super Bowl championships. The Redskins have won three, right? If you're a Redskins fan, do you know... Right, the 1980s were their year. That was their decade. They were so strong. That was their strongest year, their strongest decade. They were in the Super Bowl three times in the 1980s, and they won the Super Bowl twice. So certainly, a plethora of these games must have taken place in the age where it would have been a very competitive series. The Washington Redskins and the Dallas Cowboys played absolutely zero times in the 1980s. Didn't play at all. The decade that would have been the most competitive between the two teams held no games whatsoever. So why? Why did they play? Well, when you look back at this history, right? This holiday that began with the celebration of King James for the great dying and the first Thanksgiving at Plymouth Rock because this entire village of Native peoples had been wiped out. When we look at this centuries of ethnic cleansing and genocide, as we expand west and complete our manifest destiny. And then is our greatest president. And the reason he's our greatest president is because he did this, is he ethnically cleansed the route of the Transcontinental Railway, making that railway possible. Right? The NFL knows what the American people want on Thanksgiving. They understand this to a T. When the, when the American citizens finish their turkey dinner, they love to watch cowboys massacre redskins. Found this meme. Didn't even take very long to find it. Some people hate Trump. Some people hate Hillary. But everyone hates the redskins. So what do we do? What do we do? As I said, right, I, I tried for years to find a way to redeem this holiday. I mean, how can you not advocate for a holiday that calls for the giving of thanks? And I tried for years 
to find a way to redeem this holiday, to reset it, to make it an okay holiday to participate in, to change the focus of it. But what it came down to was when I did that, it meant I wasn't I wasn't correctly repulsed by the actions of Abraham Lincoln. I wasn't repulsed by his white supremacist words. I wasn't repulsed by the genocide that he enacted against Native peoples. I wasn't nauseated by those things enough. And so I thought, there has to be a way we can make this right. There has to be a way that we can somehow redeem or save this holiday. But we can't. In his Thanksgiving Day proclamation, Abraham Lincoln called work to unify this country by calling the American people to set aside a day of thanksgiving to give thanks to God for the fruits of the genocide he was actively committing. And nowhere in our history would we ever, if we're in our right minds, would we ever agree to, yes, let's do that, right? If, if there was a celebration in Germany that was celebrating the milestones of the Holocaust that was called together by Adolf Hitler, right? That day would have been erased long, long ago. Never would have even thought about, let's try to reclaim that day. That would just be an absurd thought. But because we are not properly repulsed by the actions and the words and the attitudes of this man, because we think, no, he was a good guy. He was just having a hard time. He was just struggling. He abolished slavery. No, he didn't. He didn't abolish slavery. Redefined and codified it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. The guy was a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist and was actively committing genocide against Native peoples when he was assassinated. I can only imagine how many Native lives were spared because Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. Abraham Lincoln is not a man we should celebrate. He is not a man we should be proud of to have in our history. Absolutely, we have to acknowledge his existence and his presence and the things he did, but not to celebrate them, to remind ourselves of the horrors that we enacted as a nation the attitudes that we held, the dehumanizing white supremacist attitudes that our nation held and was founded on and celebrated to this day. Our problem is, is we're not properly repulsed by the oppression of people of color, by the enslavement of African people, and by the genocide of Native peoples. We are not properly repulsed by that. And therefore, we try to redeem these holidays, right? We, we have a Declaration of Independence that literally calls Native people savages. We have a constitution that protects slavery, codifies it in our criminal justice system. We have a constitution that to this day 2022 does not mention women, period. <laughs> not a single female pronoun in the entire document. We love to celebrate that it's 2022 and we have our first woman in this position, our first person of color in this position. And these aren't things to celebrate. It's Frickin' 2022. That's a shame that we don't have not had these things before. We're a nation that trumpets the fact that we believe in equality and freedom. And it's 2022, and we have our first Native American female cabinet member. 
our first woman of color serving in the vice presidential position. It's 2022, people. We should not be proud of the fact that we are doing this today. This is like a 50-year-old man celebrating the fact that he learned how to wipe his butt for the first time. Should have learned that long time ago, guy. Nothing to celebrate. It's a shame. We should be ashamed that it's 2022 and we are still celebrating a holiday rooted, rooted in the genocide of indigenous peoples. Had Robert E. Lee brought Thanksgiving into the modern era, we would have dropped the holiday a long time ago. He lost the war, right? Abraham Lincoln won his war. So he's a hero. We need to be repulsed. We need to be sickened by our history, not to bury it or forget it, but to learn from it and say we never, ever want to celebrate that again. And so I stopped a few years ago. I stopped celebrating Thanksgiving. And I think you should too. I want to challenge you. I want to invite you to free yourself from our dehumanizing colonial holidays. I want to invite you to decline Lincoln's invitation to give thanks for genocide. And instead, let's mourn this. Let's lament what we've done. And let's change. Let's do something different. Not to reclaim it on the fourth Thursday of every November. No, let's leave that day as a dark day in our history. Leave it there. Let's start a new tradition, a different day, a different month. Something that's rooted in the lifting up of people. The humanity, acknowledging the humanity of people. That's my challenge to you, my brothers and sisters. That's my invitation to you. I invite you to join me in rejecting these dehumanizing colonial holidays. Let's do something different. Let's become something new. Thank you for taking some time to wrestle through this history with me. I freely acknowledge it took me years to get to the point where I stopped celebrating this holiday. I don't expect our nation to change overnight. That's why I wanted to teach this history. That's why I wanted to plant these seeds. That's why I wanted to create this common memory. So that we can get to the point quickly, I hope, within a few years of deciding as a nation that we no longer want this to be a part of our identity. And we'll change it. We'll change it. 
Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Enjoy your time with family. Enjoy your few days off work. Travel safe. Walk in beauty, my relatives. And may we all learn how to walk in beauty together. Hakonet.